he started his career at Bottega Veneta, where he quickly rose the ranks to head designer. After Bottega Veneta, he went to work for Gucci under the then designer Tom Ford. After that, he started his own label in 2003, and since then has dressed a slew of celebrities, from Angelina Jolie to Sarah Jessica Parker, Solange Knowles, Victoria Beckham, to mention a few. Please welcome, with a big round of applause, Mr. Giles Deacon. How are we? All good. Thank you for coming along today. It's um, a real pleasure to be in Lagos, my very first time to um, Western Africa. So um, we've had a great couple of days, all thanks to um, GT Bank, who I think have put on the most phenomenal um, events weekend for everybody. And I think um, I'm hoping that after all of the talks, masterclasses and the shows that people are going to go away feeling inspired, and you know, wanting to get on and do lots of fantastic creative things in the world, which is what we're all here for. So I thought I'd be here today and talk to you about some of my experiences in the fashion industry as a designer, as a creative director, and running your own business, because I know that there's a lot of people here who are, do, who are doing that and working out ways in which they can carry on doing that for, you know, and expanding their careers. So I'd, I'll start with the beginning and give you a bit of an insight into my, my personal background. Uh, I was born in the north of England um, into a non-creative family. Um, my mother, I think the most creative thing she did was flower arranging on a Sunday, which I would go and help her with. Um, my father worked in agriculture. So, you know, really not jazzy um, background at all from that respect. Um, I lived in the middle of nowhere. The nearest house was three miles away. So after every day at school, holidays, weekends, I was outside just running around in nature, um, collecting things, and m most importantly, drawing. And it was, I think, at this point that my kind of possible future of, of working in a creative industry started. Uh, I, I, th that thing of just having that hand-to-eye world of collecting, thinking about things, looking at nature in all of its fantastic forms was something that I think has definitely gone on to inspire me in many, many ways down the line in my career. I was terrible at school, got thrown out of nearly every class imaginable, from biology, even, even out of art I was thrown out of for hitting my art teacher over the head with a shoe. So um, I wasn't bad, bad, but it was, you know, kind of vaguely bad. And um, I failed my um, O levels, and so I, I think I got an E in one A level, which basically means nothing. You're going nowhere. So I was really confused as to what to do, and um, I, a friend of my um, mother's suggested that I go and do an art foundation course. So I, I thought, Christ, I've got nothing I can show them. What am I going to do? So I borrowed some things off some friends, um, got some drawings done, found some of my old sketchbooks when I was a kid, and just met, got this suitcase full of stuff. There was like a, a tapestry owl, all sorts of funny things in there, and went down to the, called up the local um, art foundation um, class, and um, it, the term had already started, and the, the, the Tony Gell, the head tutor there, um, had two spaces left um, from people who hadn't turned up. And he just looked at everything and said, you're a complete wild card. Um, I, I like what you've got here. Um, come on. I started the Art Foundation, and I just loved it. I loved doing the, the fashion set of the, of the course the most. And by the Christmas time, I developed my portfolio to the degree in which that, um, they felt it, it was appropriate that I could apply to um, St. Martin's School of Art, which, as we all know, is one of the most forefront art colleges in the world. I very luckily got on there, and it was there well, from moving from the countryside in, in north of England, moving into London in the late 80s when there was all the most fantastic club scene, incredible art scene, music, film, and just totally immersed myself in that. And at that time, St. Martin's was right in the middle of London, so you could walk out and just go from sex shops to the British Museum to gigs, you name it. There was, everything was there right in front of you. It still is a fantastic college, but at that time was a real goal, I think. 
And on graduation from um, St. Martin's, I was very luckily asked to go and have an interview with, at this time, um, a man that no one had really heard of. He'd just left Ralph Lauren to go and work for Gucci when the Maurizio Gucci, the then owner, was still alive. And uh, uh, this man was Tom Ford. And Tom um, saw my portfolio, said, yeah, great, I'd love you to do some work. I did lots of prediction work and research work for them. I did that for about a year and a half, and then that wasn't really expanding into a full-time job for me. So I wondered what to do. So I thought, all right, I'll go and have a look around some, uh, getting a job in Paris. And just to kind of remind you of all of this, this is all before the internet. Uh, this is at a time when you'd, you'd go to Paris, you took your portfolio, you left your um, portfolio with the Bureau de Steel, and the Chef de Steel would come and see it. You'd get a call back to come and pick it up, and if you were lucky, you were then taken in to have an interview where you could possibly become a stagiaire, an intern, basically. All unpaid. And uh, I tried Chanel, nothing happening there. Tried a couple of other places, nothing. And then I got a, a return to a, a great place, um, this designer called Jean-Charles de Castelbajac, who is kind of like the French Vivian Westwood, for, of a better term. And I, I was thrown into doing... Uh, my first job for him was to look after all the um, Asian licenses. So I was looking after umbrellas, pencil cases, handbags, you name it. And the experience of that was incredible because there was, you were working with um, Japanese licensed companies and like one time I forgot to put the specs on, on the drawing that was sent to them and it was a handbag this big and it actually came back made that size, which was quite phenomenal. So I did that for a few years, then wanted to move back to London and it was, this was at a time when London was really having a, a, a really interesting creative time. There was, it was at the time when um, Dazed and Confused magazine was being launched. Um, a good friend of mine from St. Martin's, a lady called Katie Grand, who's the editor of Love magazine, um, she was uh, the fashion director there. And it, it was a real kind of melting pot of, of everybody from all the colleges, people who ran clubs, people who had bands, photographers, uh, journalists, you name it, everybody in a kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a quite brilliant scene which lasted for a long time and, and I think it was something that was touched upon yesterday by Vanessa was that um, thinking about all your kinds of, of contemporaries in lots of different artistic spheres and creative spheres that you know and, and working with them and working together is really, really important to have a, 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 a very healthy competitiveness. There's no need for a kind of nasty bitchiness between people, I don't think. The best things are done when it's all very you know, constructive and creatively um, competitive. That's the way you, know, you, you can really make a force of what your world is about in, in, in good numbers of people. So that all was super. London was really kicking along well. And then I got the opportunity to um, be the um, creative director of um, Bottega Veneta, which at this point was owned by a, a private um, couple, Mr. and Mrs. Moltedo, who had spent most of their 70s flying between Venice and M Manhattan. And they were really a, a bit of a their t lose the end of their tether as to where the company was at that point of time. It had a you know, huge success and was a, kind of fallen off the map a little bit. And, um, and they en enlisted myself, Katie Grand, and Stuart Vivas, who's now the um, creative director at Coach in New York, um, to come in and kind of reinvigorate it. And we were totally out of our depth. But it, we had the most incredible experience and learning what to do within all of that, 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 that period of time. It was... It was really quite phenomenal. Let me just find a slide of that. Some of you may remember this, this, this was 1998, 99, and there was the wonderful model of Myra, and, oh, not that one, and then, so th th this, that was the last, uh, sorry there, that was the last collection that we did for them. And at this time, Tom Ford and his then um, f CEO financial guy, um, Domenico De Sole, came in to wanting to buy Bottega Veneta. So, and it was the first time that I'd ever been in the middle of a hostile takeover. Tom wanted to turn it into something else, and so I got fired and then employed by him to go and work at Gucci. So I did that for a couple of years again, so working for Tom like 10 years later, um, and then I kind of decided I, I really wanted to, I'd always wanted to do my own label, but I'd wanted to get experience out in the, 
in the world, so working in Paris, but in New York, and in, in, in Milan, and to, and to see how all sorts of other places work. So I felt it was like the right time. And we decided to launch the, um, the collection in London. And uh, London at that time was not having a brilliant, brilliant time. Um, this is when Lee McQueen had gone to um, Paris, Stella McCartney, Hussein Chalayan, and London was kind of a bit down on its luck in lots of ways. So we thought it was a really good time to, to launch the collection. And I pulled in as many favors as I could from uh, people I'd known and worked with before, and launched the collection um, in 2003, four. And we had, it was in this wonderful old um, venue of the um, Chelsea Royal Hospital. And I really love history. It's one of those things that I'm incredibly passionate about. And, they, the, and putting on shows that give great sense of atmosphere and storytelling and, and theatre and really fire the imagination in thoughts of really pushing you into kind of other thoughts of, of fantastical worlds. That's the kind of thing that I, really gets me going. So we had... Great girls like Nadia Rauman, some of the supermodels who'd never walked in London catwalks altogether. And the result of that was that the next day, I had the front cover of Women's Wear Daily, and the front cover of the New York Times, and the front cover of The Sun. So that is three newspapers in the UK covering so many, and the States covering so many different spectrums, was really, really interesting. So I've got some examples of some of the pieces from the collections there. Again, on the, the, the picture of Linda Valangelista on the, on the far right, um, very nature-inspired. Um, those were um, some prints that I worked on that were all based on traditional marquetry technique, wood, inlaying of lots of different pieces of wood, but got all sorts of different imagery from kind of bees and chimpanzees and all sorts of animals that I felt were really interesting to go in there. Then moved on a few years further down the line, and we did this show in 2009. And this is just to give you a bit of insight into some of the, the kind of references of, from a, a design process of how I like to work. I don't like things where, it, where it's just like, oh, it's inspired by a holiday or something like that. I, it has to be much more personal. And I, and I think that that's something for everybody to think about when they're doing their you know, research and design work is to think about things that are really personal to you and things that matter to you. R regardless of how irrelevant it seems, think of those, because it's those things that really make you special and it's those things that are going to make you stand out and it's going to be those things that make people want to come and be interested in what you are saying and what you do and what, what you represent. And this was a, a one of, all about kind of S&M warfare. So we had... A, big prints with cock rings and big kind of these big heavy black pleated dresses with lots of kind of spears and skeletons and all sorts of, um, you know, kind of quite dark imagery in there, but to make these really beautiful pieces around it. And um, the, the dress at the bottom, second along, was inspired by um, a car wash in London. You know when car washes start going like that and it sort of spin up? So that dress, when it moved, you spun round and it just creates the most extraordinary shape. And the, where we go, moving on, there we go. And the dress was then shot by um, Tim Walker, the f very famous fashion photographer who's just done the incredible Pirelli calendar, which is showcased in New York last week, um, for the, the V&A Museum. Let's move along. So uh, some other examples of collaborations with Stephen Jones, the milliner. I really believe in, um, you know, kind of working together, as I say, in, you know, artistic collaborations. I, f I get an awful lot out of them, and I think you get really good, um, you, you know, kind of new insights into things and different ways of working, which I think as a creative person is, is incredibly important to, to see how different people do things. There was some outsized knitwear that we did, which was it ended up um, being in the Dece uh, December issue, the September issue. The December issue has, of course, become the new September issue of, um, of American Vogue. And then a favourite of mine, the, um, the, the Pac-Man collection. Again, a kind of very irreverent um, um, kind of starting point to the collections. But um, I, I just loved Pac-Man and thought it'd be great to, you know, kind of extrapolate it all and see how far out it could be taken into a design context. 
and then oh, back again. I've oh got this very quick. This machine, sorry. And then the, the piece on the on the far right that was made with 167,000 hand embroidered um, crystals, um, Swarovski crystals on it. In there, and it was at this time that I think the the kind of way in which that I wanted to push my work into being involved in couture really started. I was getting very, you know, feeling that this was a, a, a really interesting direction for us to go in. Move on again, and this burn collection also. And then going back to the stories telling of everything, this was about um, a really beautiful house in the countryside. It could be anywhere in the world, and it was about you waking up in the middle of the night in winter, and the whole house is on fire, and you've got to find all your favourite things that you want to take out. And for instance, you're, gra you're grabbing some tapestries, some personal artefacts, a whole host of things that were. Were, were you know special and important to you, and then running out into a, like a frozen garden. So we had this transition from all these kind of burnt imagery and hot flames going into this kind of very kind of austere sort of glacial kind of world, and the contrast worked exceptionally well, I think. And here's some behind the scenes. Um, shots of, of, the, of the pieces. So the dress on the top, that was all constructed out of um, probably about three, four hundred meters of, of hand-cut strips of satin organza and um, chiffon, and then all hand burns with like a, a creme brulee cooking torch. So a very couture technique of, of a modern world put into making that piece. And then you can see we, we do, in the studio we always have a bit of fun making, oh God, making some Back and forth, making some pieces. So the girl is resting her, her elbow on a giant cigarette, which we were, got some quite good photos where we're joking about burning the holes with this, this big cigarette. And then this was one piece from that collection that we made for um, Victoria Beckham for, at, the, at the Olympics. She, the Spice Girls did a, a song there, and um, it was, they all went round quite unusually on the top of some taxis. I don't know if anybody remembers that. And this was a real favourite of mine. This was a, a, a Swan collection. Again, working with Stephen Jones, um, who I've worked with for a long, long time. And he created these most extraordinary headpieces. And, and they said, I just loved the way that they moved. And this, you know, this work of ostrich feathers, lux feel, it, it has this very kind of lux feeling. And again, this, this is a good it's kind of indication of where we're moving on to into the world of couture. I really believe in drawing a lot as well. Um, I know it's not for everyone, but I think the more you draw, the better your design work really is. It's, a, it's by far the best way to get your ideas over to the people who you work with from like, you know, in your mind to 2D to make them into 3D. <laughs> well, we'll move on from these. We've got some nice pieces to see. <laughs> so these are actually some pieces from the Couture collection that we did in Paris in, in um, last well, February. So we've got, you can, See how the workmanship is, is working on here. The piece on the far end is all made from um, laser cut uh, um, circles, which are all cut into this, these rather beautiful concentric shapes, all hand applied, and it's light as a feather, that dress on the far left. And then the second one in is a um, hand curled satin um, oysters and pearls with a miniature pearl um, embroidered into them with um, marabou feathers and, uh, on a corset base. The second dress, the third dress along is a, a cocktail dress with um, marabou feathers and the same technique. Um, the red dress is a um, pearl and um, taroni satin, all hand applied and hand manipulated, um, which was incredibly complex to make. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of my favorite pieces. And then the jacquard dress here is, is one that was um, designed from some drawings that I'd done of some flowers with some um, uh, embroideries on, on, the, on the cuffs. So they give a, a good idea of, of, of kind of where the, the, the work and technique can come to. So I don't know if the girls want to have one walk, walk around again, but I think they all look fantastic, these girls. Yeah, thank you. I, I'll, I'll go back to the slideshow for a little while. <laughs> um, th this was a, a project that I did with um, the British Olympic Council, and it was called um, Britain Creates. 
and it was uh, where a series of designers and artists were linked up, and this was done with a very dear friend of mine, Jeremy Della, who's a fantastic artist, and um, this, this was inspired by w William Morris and some athletic runners, and we built this whole kind of idea of this kind of sh sort of shamanistic um, sort of tribal feel for this, this sort of paganistic feel for, for uh, on top of the studio. And then what else have we got? Here we go to some celebrities, which I know is an important part of everyone's um, business and world and imagery. These were uh, some dresses from um, autumn, winter 2015. And we were very lucky to dress um, Kate Blanchett at the Cannes Film Festival. And that dress was voted as the, um, the second best dress at Cannes Festival, Festival all time, after um, Grace Kelly, which is no, great, no bad thing to have. It's a very lovely thing. And, um, but lo lovely Solange wore the, um, uh, this piece we made for, um, um, to the Met, though Solange was a little bit naughty because that, that dress, as you can see with um, Anna Cleveland wearing it in the middle, has quite a train to it. And when it got sent back, I was like, this looks like something's happened to this. And I inquired what had happened and um, she decided she didn't like the train and had cut it off and without asking. And um, when I politely went mad, um, wanting to find out what had happened to it, they then found out that a maid in the hotel had thrown it away. <laughs> so, but she's, she's been forgiven, we'll, dr we'll, we'll dress her again, but it was, it was not a good look at all, that. Goes with the, with the territory. And that's just some drawings and, you know, some bits and bobs, some studio work. Um, I, I really like, I photograph everything very, very um, in depth and keep a really big archive, which I think is really important for all the designers here uh, to do all of this. You, 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 I think a really great thing is, is you, when you start out, you often think, oh, this seems a bit weird. I'm, I'm really collecting and putting my own work and drawings in, you know, is my ego this out of control? But it's not. It's really, really important uh, to do that because you can go back to it time after time and often things that you thought were totally irrelevant, you'll go and think, oh my God, that was a really good idea. Oh, that's, well, that's really inspiring. Oh, that would be great to work with that. Oh, you know, and these, that kind of cross-referencing cross really enables you to build a, a really solid body of work over a period of time. And then we go, oh, there, 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 and this is the couture. Oh, sorry, no, that's it. This was the, um, the, the lookbook that we did for uh, the Couture in Paris. So we've got exquisite tailoring. All the fabrics are designed in-house. Um, nothing is bought uh, off the shelf as such, all the jacquards. Um, I try to be as sustainable as possible. Um, I work with as many local mills as I, as I can um, and, and, and really just try. The great thing about Couture is that you're only making one piece. So it's, from that aspect, it's ex extremely sustainable. You carry no stock and no inventory. Some more examples of, and, and the, the, the company at the bottom who I worked with to create those jacquards, they make all the kind of um, embassy w um, coverings of, you know, kind of fabric walls all the world over. They're, they're, and they've been going since the 1700s. Again, some of the pieces which you saw here. This is when the girls were meant to be coming out. <laughs> if you go, just to give it some coherency. <laughs> Have the girls come out one more time? Yeah, do you want to see them come out one more time? Are you, yeah, yeah. yeah. If they're still, if they're not got changed. No. <laughs> Cue the girls. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. I won't start singing. We could have got some music for this, couldn't we? <laughs> I quite like the silence, though. It gives it quite a... You're doing well, girls. You're looking very, very couture and confident there. So there we go. Oh, and there's some more, more pieces from the couture. And then I have to finish with um, this one up here. Um, in April this year, we were, well, it's the September before, we were commissioned to do um, Pippa Middleton's wedding dress. 
and um, which is a great thing to, to do. And we um, worked on that in secret for seven or eight months, um, binding a million NDAs, possibly lots of things I shouldn't really be talking about today. But um, uh, one thing, uh, you know, the, it was a, an absolute treat to work on, and, and I was very, very pleased how it came out in the end, because it was one of those things that I'd never really weirdly thought about at the time, and then I just w woke up really early the day after, and I thought, oh hell, this is obviously going to go out to every single newspaper, publication, digital, you name it, in the world. What if everybody hates it? And, you know, so those things do go through your head, naturally. And um, it, was, it was very, very thankful that the next day I got some text messages from something in Australia, pictures coming through, and I think we literally had the front cover of every single newspaper in the world on that Sunday, which was a, no mean feat at all. But, so that's kind of where we've got to really so far. That's where I, me from you know very humble beginnings to um, you know ending up showing in in Paris on the couture schedule there and making you know always trying to make beautiful things that enhance people's worlds and lives and and making the creative process as, as interesting and exciting as possible. I think it's um you know it's 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 a, it's a small thing in the world to do, but it's it, it's it's an important thing. So thank you very much. Thanks, girls. Oh, walking around again. Can't get them off now. <laughs> Anybody? Da, da, da. <laughs> Well done. So, Nicole, questions, the dreaded questions. Most of the wedding gowns yeah. we have now, is it out of um, creativity or um, thinking out of the box that we do have um, them in a couture cuts instead of the, um, the traditional conservative ball gown idea? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it always goes down to the... Whenever we work on a wedding dress, we work through a consultation process with the client. And you get to know them, and I have a, a kind of a, a mental questionnaire which I go through with them about what do you love, what do you hate, it's, it, it, and you soon get, you know, what's your lifestyle like, what do you want, lots of them a wedding, um, are you going to be doing lots of dancing, do you, um, you know, is it, is it on a beach, is it up a mountain, is it, you know, all of the, is it in a private property, what, you know, where is it, and you get, you get a good idea of what someone's looking for, because I think, yes, everything I think should look um, um, inherently modern, uh, that, you know, everybody wants to look contemporary, and, and if it, from a, a de design perspective, I think within the bridal business, it should be, you know, have a very relevant design perspective to it. Um, you, you, but at the same time, you know, with it, if you want to do a great big ball gown with an enormous big train, there's a gorgeous way of doing that. So uh, there, there is a ways around it all. But I, th I think the, the general kind of mood, or as such, is, is to go with a kind of something that's very feminine, very flattering, and but you know, has beautiful work to it, it could be in like embroideries or specific laces being made. All these things make them very, very special. My name is Precious, and I wanted to ask this question in the last class, but there was no time, but I know you could help. Um, in Nigeria, because I'm in Nigeria, so <laughs> we, I noticed that um, people into, that are in the, into fashion business, yeah. um, they, some of them, they get close to the celebrities, and with that, their business is moving. Yeah. But someone like me, that I don't even have a celebrity around me, how can I get to link myself up with them, or how can I promote myself? Because people around me, they'll be like, we can't pay the price you are giving us. Uh, who are you? Uh, it's not that maybe you have this big fashion house. We can't pay up to that. Well, we notice that people that are already in the business that are big already, they are making it more. They are making it big because people pay them well. But we that we've not climbed up to that level, we don't even have enough money to establish ourselves very yeah. well. How can we promote ourselves. I mean, how can we make our clients to pay up more well, I, <laughs> that will help us too? Well, I, th I think the, impor the important thing is, is that, is that um, everything takes time. 
There's no easy way of making it quick and big in the fashion industry as a designer. And I think the important thing to do is that you have a very recognisable style and, and, a, and a certain yeah. quality of work that, that will attract the clients that you're wanting to, to, to work with. So they see and perceive you to be uh, something that they want to in invest their money in. And I think that really comes from doing the, the right work and the right designs, you know, it, it, to those and then get, that will get to those customers who will then appreciate what you do, and then it's, it can be very word of mouth. Uh, there's also, as we all know, the very you know, wonderful world of social media to push things through, but don't underestimate the word of mouth within a, pri a private client context. Okay, I saw some of your sketches. Yeah. And I know you didn't start like one day and you started sketching, so I wanted to ask, was it a natural ability, or you learned it? It's, I, I think it was partially because I drew always as a child, but they were not like fashion drawings or anything like that. I used to draw hedgehogs and, and dogs and God knows whatever. Um, but it was when I was at, um, at St. Martin's that I really, really got into drawing and doing lots of life drawing. And I used to go to life drawing classes every day. And it was that that really got you to understand how the body works, how different bodies work, how you know, clothes fall and drape on people. And you get a really good understanding. And, and I really think you know, time is never on anyone's side. But to do a, a drawing every day and as much as possible, it really keeps you in. Your, your, it's that hand-eye coordination is incredibly important. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the um, class. I have three questions. Okay, three. Yes. You're not holding back, are you? As an upcoming illustrator, what are the necessary skills that we need to acquire and how do we acquire them? Become an illustrator. Upcoming illustrator. What skills do what we skills need? What skills do you need? Well, yes. uh, you have to have a gorgeous technique um, and, and, a, and a style that is uniquely yours that is no one else's and the one that you have really thought about, and you maybe use lots of color, lots of gorgeous line, and you know, make it something that you, you feel inspired about when you look at. You, know, you want to be like, wow, I love that. And how do we acquire them? Like, how do you acquire those? Yeah, those yeah, how do we yeah acquire well, this is the tricky thing about having skills. You, you know, I think a good way is to, um, is to look at lots of um, past and present illustrators and illustrations that you like, and there's maybe a sort of style that you gravitate towards or inspired by, um, or th that can really help. Or, I don't know, you know I, I'm always inspired by you know, kind of nature and people. They're my two things that I go to when I'm drawing. Um, so if I'm sat in an airport or in a hotel, I'll sit and draw away while I'm waiting for someone. Or if I'm in the countryside, I'll sit and draw some flowers and plants. And those can lead into the most extraordinary places. And then you can drop people into those backdrops, and or plants can come in front of the people, and all of these things. So if, find some things that interest you. You might be interested in, I don't know, broken down cars, for instance, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, they're great things to draw, and then draw some gorgeous girls, or, you know, all around them. I think, I think inventing a world is really good as well. Okay. The second question is... Um, Sorry, just your mouth. Sorry. The second question is, what are the necessary tools to be used in getting a well-defined illustration? What, 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 what are the necessary tools? The tools? Like, like um... Oh, my um, God. I think the best is pencil and paper. It doesn't really get better than that. You know, it's, if, you can, if, you, if you get on well with that, you can get on well with anything. Good afternoon. Thank you for the class. That's okay. Uh, my question is, when you're designing, do you consider the kind of fabrics? Do you have, like, background knowledge about fabrics, how they drape? Yeah. And the kind of, as some customers, they might ask to design that things... It, like you have a design that they say use this fabric and you know this fabric won't work. So how does that affect your work, the kind of materials you work with and how you can merge that with your design? Well, I, I, I love textiles, uh, I love prints and I love colour. Um, so all, all the fabrics that I use with will be digitally printed or screen printed, can be from like satin or ganzas to, um, you know, you, you name it, across the gamut of fabrics. And when I'm working with a particular client, um, I always make sure that whatever the style I that we're working on is going to work for them. And it's no use if someone says, oh, I want to stretch satin, and you know it's not going to work. You just have to be really honest with them and, and, and give uh, options that you know are going to work and explain why. 
That's the, that's the best way to do it. But also people are coming to you as much as you, know, you are going to design and work with them to get the best thing for them. They're wanting your opinion and your knowledge and it's fair expertise. So um, it's, I think it's fair to impart that upon them. Hello. Hello. Uh, my question is, what are your thoughts on the control process and yeah. products nowadays? Because recently we've been seeing um, control collections that are increasingly becoming commercial. Is it uh, seasonal trends or pro probably um, the direction in which I uh, end craftsmanship is headed? So I think he's asking just now, nowadays, Couture is becoming a little bit more commercial. Right. So he's asking yeah, why yeah, yeah. that is. No, well, I think it is. Um, it, it, but, but I don't think in, in any way it's become commercially boring. Um, I think that it, the, business, the sales of... Um, Sales of couture are up by 700% um, worldwide at the moment. And that's you know, a great thing. It enables businesses to work. It enables us to make beautiful things, work with incredible um, embroiderers, um, developers, t you know, technicians. And uh, I think it, it, couture is always about a certain subtlety. And, and uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a very personal thing as well. And I think that, you know, it's, it, I, I like, I, I like things that can, can you know, have a, have a character of their own. Each design has got a, you know, a story to it. And that's very important. They don't have to be particularly outlandish designs. You know, some clients really want that, in which case, great, you've got free reign to go crazy with them. We have a client who um, lives in Shanghai, and she buys off many, uh, five or six pieces, but she buys probably five or six pieces of us a season, and they are the most bonkers pieces you can possibly imagine, in the most brilliant, brilliant way, and she wears them solely for dinner with her husband every evening. She never wears them out. Yeah, so it's that kind of extraordinary world, it, you know, that, that, that you're working in. Sorry guys, we've run out of time, but yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much.